I'm so glad to finally be this. Is, even though I've seen you on YouTube videos. And, mm -hmm. <laughs> and, I, and I even met Marley on the video. So. Um, and everybody here at MSU who, who is paying this wonderful tribute to a wonderful man. Um, so I want, so thank you. My, my uh, remarks are going to be uh, an exercise in what we in literary criticism call biographical fallacies. And I think maybe in an effort, Stephen, to get at the, the unnerving coincidence between this, the title of Aimé's book and the story of his life. That this is, um, because they are all about coincidence. So, uh, how many, so there have to be a lot of people here from English, right? So you all know what a biographical fallacy is. Oh, but there are historians too. Um, so I'll just, uh, these uh, biographical fallacies are, or had been, complete anathema to the new critics and the post-structuralist death of the author advocates alike. The biographical fallacy, the belief that is that one can explicate the meaning of a work of literature by asserting that it is really about events in the author's life. I've actually come to believe in the biographical fallacy. Um, but I should make full disclosure, although I've already been exposed, um, I did have the privilege to direct a base dissertation. And it's been really quite remarkable listening to the first panel and hearing from everybody and meeting Mr. Ellis um, and realizing that there are at least <coughs> four generations of MA's biography gathered in this, in this room. Mr. Ellis, although I think I might be your generation. <laughs> um, but um, people my age and our age uh, who um, had MA as students. Then fellow students like Salah of MAs who now have students of their own. And then Colin and uh, Rashida uh, this morning who have, who are carrying on MAs work. I mean, it's, it's really quite, quite remarkable. And that's not a fallacy, even though it has to do with biography. Um, but I also really want to, oh, actually I should also mention that um, even though I read Aimee's dissertation, like, many times, um, I had no idea that it was going to culminate in this absolutely extraordinary book. Um, and I also want to give real credit and tribute to all those who finished Aimee's book for him. Um, as your dean mentioned earlier today, that is, that is itself a tribute to just how important that work is and how much more important it became because of the collaborations that went into it. Um, another book that I read this summer, however, was Manning, Manning on Marable's biography of uh, Malcolm X, subtitled A Life of Reinvention. Have any of you read that? It's amazing, isn't it? Um, and uh, people after, after, I, after I admitted to having read it wanted to know what I thought about all of the controversies that had been brought up by, by uh, Marable in this reinvention of uh, Malcolm's life. And I realized I couldn't respond to that because I couldn't read a reinvention of a life without thinking of Manning Marable who died on the occasion of the book's publication. And I have to say, I could not read either Aimé's book separate from Aimé. Um, and so I want to think a little bit with you about Manning Marable and Malcolm X and Aimé Ellis and Richard Wright, Eldridge uh, Cleaver, uh, McCain, uh, Tupac Shakur, D'Angelo, and so on. Their, their lives are so inextricably entwined now on the occasion of their deaths. And just so that you don't think I have any kind of attitude about historians, um, I want to go into a little bit of history now. Um, 
to think about the relationship between biography and the historical uh, narrative. And really, the legacy of both Marable slash Malcolm and Aimé slash Bigger Thomas and Biggie Smalls. And that is the posthumous <coughs> and the international. Because I don't think that Aimé actually became a student of African American studies. I think he internationalized African American studies. In much the same way that Malcolm X said, civil rights is not enough. Until we engage with questions of human rights, the United States and, it, and the violence it has committed against African Americans, Native Americans, will never be brought before the court of world opinion. But, and I think that uh, M.A. in his book provides an incredible biography, if you will, of poor urban black young men. But it's also a historical narrative. From uh, Richard Wright in uh, 1940 to Eldridge Cleaver in the 1960s to Nathan McCall, in the 1960s and 70s to Tupac Shakur in the 1990s to D'Angelo at the turn of the century. He is rewriting through biography a very, very important narrative. But he's doing it, I think, very significantly informed by the work of Fritz Fanon on the one hand and Malcolm X on the other. I think these are the two most recurring references, or at least they're the ones that I notice the most. Um, in if, uh, in, in If We Must Die. Um, and both Fanon and Malcolm X challenged the prevailing and often too prevaricating parsing of the international and the question of human rights and social justice. And I would suggest there's a real danger in disaggregating or disarticulating the local from the global, the national from the international, etc. But Fanon and, it, and he's been mentioned on several occasions <laughs> here today, Fanon on anti-colonial violence, and as I said, Malcolm X on human rights. Um, it's also worth thinking about the changed alignments that have emerged over the decades, and not without consequences for the way that academics and advocates address and or redress distortions raised historically by the changing decades. There is a kind of movement, if you will, from resistance to rights. So that's a, sh that's a shift in the uh, political arena. But M.A. asks us to think historically about post-depression 1940, 1960s and 1970s, the national liberation struggles and the civil rights movements, the 1990s, the post-bipolar world order, as they like to call it, and the end, as others would like to suggest, of the third world. And finally, the contemporary war on terror. Um, and how, now I'm putting, back, putting my literary critical cap back on, how have the literary genres themselves changed in response over these same decades? And that's another literary critical narrative that I think M.A. invites us to rethink from the novel to the memoir to hip hop and rap. These are perhaps some of the new directions that M.A.'s project suggests. Taking us from the prison, the streets, the first world and the third world to, ge to new geopolitical axes of north and south, to Islamophobia and hip hop diplomacy, maybe even to think about Palestine's bid for statehood at the, at the UN. I have to bring in Palestine, of course. Um, so if, if we must die, let there still be lives of reinvention. And may the fallacies of biography provide new narratives, stories, and yet more tales to tell. Thank you. <laughs>